Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, I'm Alison Larkin, writer, comedian, narrator, and host of The Jane Austen Podcast. Join me as we embark on a journey through Austen's timeless stories, starting with Pride and Prejudice. The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, there's, you know, there's a couple that come to mind, which was when I was in Toronto and I had recently transitioned. So I had been auditioning, you know, perceived as a female Mm -hmm. and then audition after I've emerged as my, you know, as as my authentic self, self, which is a man. And I remember showing up at this one audition and there was a woman who is sort of notoriously a little What's a nice way to say this? Um, gregarious, maybe. Um, just she had a big mouth. Anyway, she was just like <laughs> this woman was just like known for just like you know just saying everything. And I'm sitting there and I see her. I'm like, oh no, right? And she looks at me. She goes, "You have a sister." <laughs> uh, and and stupidly I said no and she's like no 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 you look like someone that I used to see a lot at auditions you have a sister you must have a sister oh no no I don't have a sister come on you have a sister you know what yeah I do I have I have a sister world and welcome back to another episode of thanks for coming in i'm your host jillian claire if this is your first time tuning in this is the show where i speak to fellow actors about their journey in the industry and i make them share a couple bad audition stories with me if you're not following the show on social media those links are in the show notes you can also check out our patreon to see the video version of these interviews all right today we have a very very special guest i was so stoked to talk to him um You may know him from Henry Danger or Danger Force. He's been in a thousand other things. He's also an acting teacher. I'm putting that um, link in the show notes as well for his classes. He has a Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology. I mean, he's done everything. He is an icon in the LGBTQ plus community. I'm very excited to welcome the one and only Michael D. Cohen. And welcome to the show, Michael. Hi. So nice to be here, Jillian. Thanks for having me. So excited to have you here. Um, Before we get started, I wanted to let you know, I visited the set of Henry Danger back in 2019. What? I was shadowing Steve Hafer because he directed me on Victorious and he was kind enough to let me come and hang out with y'all for a little bit. And it was so fun. It was such a cool show to see live. That is is phenomenal. You know, yes, I remember you. I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm not... (laughs) I barely remember I, Steve. No, it was, of course I remember Steve. Steve directed so many episodes of our show. Um, that's really cool. Um, yeah, it's a very fun show to to watch. Be, I mean, you know, most sitcoms or multicam shows you watch um, or you shoot like with an audience, you know. But right. our show had so many effects and everything that it took three days to shoot. And so there was no way to have an audience. That, I mean – some people will be willing to camp out for three days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But most people won't. So yeah, we had a we had a laugh track for for ours. As many a lot of the kids do and a lot, a lot of kids' shows do now and, and also with COVID, they just couldn't have audiences eventually. So, you know, yeah. it's kind of the norm now. It was a very fun show to watch. I had never seen something that, like you said, has so many effects. Um, but I do remember the best part about my entire trip there was it was also you guys were watching the um, the musical episode. 
And so I was there and I got to see it ahead of time with all of you. Oh, and it was so fun. You were at the actual screening that we had in the studio. Yeah, like oh my the gosh. Bean bags and all the, I mean, yeah. what a great time. That was, that was really great. That was sort of like, I think of that as sort of the, a bit of a Nickelodeon heyday, you know, that was, yes. they, um, they, they took care of us and, and, uh, we had popcorn and like yep. candy and everybody sat and watched and yeah, that was very cool. It's cool that you witnessed that. I uh, know. It was so fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, before we get into all of the awesome stuff that you're doing now and talking more about Henry Danger and Danger Force, I would love to go back and ask you, what made you want to be an actor? Wow. Well, let's just say, first of all, let me preface this by saying that anybody that's an actor doesn't really have a choice. You know, mm-hmm. it's sort of, it's like, I also see that very parallel with the the gender journey, you know, like you are born a certain way and mm. it's non-negotiable. You just, this is how you are. And I think that being an artist or being an actor or something that's expressive like that, you are born with that need to, to operate that way in the world. And um, anything short of that is you not being fulfilling your full potential, but also just feeling wrong in the world. You know, you just Mm. don't, you just feel like I, I have to do this. I have to do this or I am not going to be able to function properly. And that's sort of, I think I realized that really early on in my life, like four years old. And I was watching, um, watching the Carol Burnett show and, and actually see her. I have got two pictures now. (laughs) Yeah. I've got an old one. I just got a new one that I just got, which was, um, very sweet, uh, very uh, very privileged to, 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 to get this new one that has my name on it. It's like, wow. Um, oh. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was watching the Carol Burnett show at four years old and I kind of like, um, realized recently that really what it was is like, I imprinted on her. Like I, I, mm. there was something about who I was, my sensibility around comedy, something about it that watching her show brought that out. It, it, it was like, I recognized it and went, that's me. That's what I do. Wow. That's who I am. And so that started at a really, really early age. Um, but growing up in Canada and not having access like we do here in LA to, I couldn't, you know, couldn't do background. I couldn't do, I, I did, there were no opportunities. So um, it took a long time. <laughs> it took a long time <laughs> to, to realize my, my dream kind of thing. Um, but eventually I did, you know, I moved to Toronto, got more work there and then got enough credits to get a visa to move to LA, to move to the States and live in LA and, and work. So. Wow. But you, I mean, you went to college and you graduated with a bachelor of science in cell biology, which just is like those words together don't even make sense to me. I mean, my Lord, you are so smart. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I've always been really academic. So it's always been a bit of a struggle to justify how do I, how do I work in an area that isn't really academic? It's much more artistic and expressive versus this mm. sort of left brain thing. I'm very like, when you do the Myers-Briggs thing, you know, the, mm-hmm. and, and there's the thinking feeling like mine is like equal. Um, oh, wow. And, and so I'm very analytical, but I'm also very very sensitive. Like uh, sometimes I'm like, Oh God, (laughs) I'm feeling too much. Um, I feel that so hard. Do you really? Oh my God. It's hard because some of us are just that way in the world. We feel everything and it becomes, it's not a world that supports that. So, um, I started off as a theater major and Mm. I just, couldn't wrap my head around it. I couldn't swing it. I, I just, really? yeah, I kind of, I sabotaged my second year audition for, like I did first year and I sabotaged my second year audition and, and like, just, it's like, I can't, I can't do this. So wow. I, um, I pursued biology and really loved it. And it really helped me. I think that as, as an acting coach as well, to help be able to, to translate how the body integrates with our mind and our emotions and our spirit to help mm-hmm. people understand that in a grounded way, as opposed to some sort of like, just feel your feet on the floor, which is, I have to say very useful 
Um, yes. But if, it's, if that's all it is, you know, then it's not helpful. If I can say, listen, you know, there is there are molecules and there's energy and this is how energy works in your body and this is how we can master our, or at least work towards mastering our energy in our body. That is so much about acting. This kind of mm. shape-shifting manipulation of energy within our system is really, it's like an internal martial art. And, mm, and so yeah. when we approach it that way, it's much more accessible and more fun than this sort of mysterious thing. So I love that I got my undergrad in, in cell biology and I love what it gave me. And, and um, I love that I understand that and still am interested in it because it feels like it really, as much as it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with acting, it has everything to do with acting. You know, I've had a similar conversation with several people on the show, and it's like people who have studied in a different area of academics or whatever have been able to figure out a way to apply it into acting, into the arts. Oh, yeah. I mean, I studied sociology for a while, and it was so important to me because I figured out how people react to each other, how their community affects them, their, their person, how everything around them affects who they are, the corner mart the you know park everything affects who you are so I think it's really cool that you've been able to take this incredible knowledge that I think for a lot of people would be difficult to understand and apply it into your artistic and creative self I mean that's really awesome uh well thank you and and you know kudos to you too for being able to take that you know the sociology is so connected to yeah. being a performer um to, to the, the ability to observe others. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Meryl Streep is as great as she is, um, I'm sure there's many reasons, but one of the things she talks about is her insatiable curiosity about what it feels like to be another person. Mm. And so she just immerses herself into the observation and, and the curiosity and to, to the degree that most of us don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and so it, the, you know, she creates the illusion of just disappearing. Yeah. It's a disappearing act. It's, and so, you know, being able to understand sociology is a huge gift. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, you have been in so many things. You have worked so, so much, but I wonder, do you remember the first time that you were on a set and you were like, Man, this is this is cool. This is special. I'm excited about this. Yeah, uh, I have always. I mean, I love I love film, but I also really have an affinity to TV, which is and TV production, which is you know probably the Carol Burnett show stuff of live, you know right. from or not live, but you know from CBS Studios in Hollywood, Television yeah. City in Hollywood, you know. And I was like, oh, I want to go to Television City in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> I want to be there. And uh, I remember going into a TV studio, the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Vancouver, and a friend of mine and I, we were like 12 or 13, we used to go to the tapings of the Renee Samard show, which was like, you know, it was just, it was just being in that studio and seeing the cameras and it was sort of bittersweet because I wanted to be a part of it, but all I was just sitting in an audience, you know, I was like, oh, I want to, mm. you know, but I just felt that. There was something I felt like I was at home, felt like home. Mm. And and then when I graduated um, from university, I started working behind the scenes like as a PA and things like that, which I completely encourage people to do who are interested in acting to understand how things work from a production perspective is so helpful. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so I was working as a PA. And um, I was on film sets, which also was, which felt great, but it wasn't quite, it was like, this is all, you know, I'm outside, I'm where I normally would hang out, but there just happens to be like, I'm, I have a traffic vest on and a, you yeah. know, an orange cone, like this doesn't, you know, um, <laughs> but when I started working in television behind the scenes and being in studios, that's when I was like, okay, this feels really, this feels really good. I worked in news. Wow. You know, I worked in news, we're operating at the teleprompter, which we had at the time. And um, and then when I got my first acting gig and the camera was right here, like I had to do mm -hmm. this scene in a hospital and the camera was literally like 
I mean, you can't see my hand. It was, it was probably a foot from my face. Oh, man. And so, like, my first acting game, and I was like, thank you. I feel so good right now. I feel so at home. <laughs> this camera feels like this was a, an extension of my being. This camera Dear feels arm. so right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was it's just an odd feeling. It's like, why does having this massive camera in my face feel so good? And it did. Mm. It just did. I, you know, I knew I was in the right place. So, uh, and you've, you've talked a lot about television versus film. And I find it so interesting because so rarely as, as a artist, do you connect with one specific um, form of, of art so, so much. But like you said, it's, it goes back to your childhood. It goes back to Carol Burnett. It goes back to that feeling of like, home like you said like that home feeling watching carol and then realizing when you were there feeling that yeah it really does you know i remember even in like maybe the fourth season of henry danger at one point i had this moment where i walked you know do you walk down the hallway where all our dressings are and they open up the studio door and i walked in and the smell of the studio which has a particular kind of scent of construction or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then looking up and seeing the lights and seeing behind the sets, you know, the, the man cave on one side and like the living room on that, you know, and, and I walk in and I just, this feeling hit me. And this is in the fourth season. I was like, oh, God, I love this. Like, mm. I love this. It It's, I must have been reincarnated from some TV, from a camera or from a- Had to. Know, something. <laughs> Had um, to. Yeah, it just, just the sets, just, just everything about it just felt like, God, this is, this is so amazing. So it's just a wonderful feeling. Well, now that we're at Henry Danger, I, I wondered if you would like to share how you got this role. I mean, this role is so fun. <laughs> He's such a character. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. What was this process like for you? You mean getting the role? Yeah getting the role and then also maybe just like how you discovered him because he's so different than you. Yeah. Um, how that was for you to create this character. Well, I give a lot of credit to the writers, you know, to put a character like that into the story. It makes, it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they created this, you know, I think at first he was an alien. Really? Uh, yeah. At first he was written as an alien and then they made him, you know, just a, a guy, you know, but, <laughs> but yeah, it was from outer space at first, I think. Um, and also, so the story goes that I was called in for an audition for Dr. Mignac, who's played perfectly by Mike Ostrowski, um, who is probably six, four, six foot four, maybe six, five. He's really tall. Um, very tall person, <laughs> very tall person, really talented guy. And, um, I, the only thing at that point that was on the air that I could watch when I had the audition was the pilot. Mm. And, you know, there was the villain that played by Ben Giroux. He's like my height. I'm thinking, well, they're not going to hire another, like what, are all the villains on this show, like under five, five, like what's, what's the deal? Like, like, okay, I'll still audition for this, but I don't think I'm going to get it. So I came in audition for it and Christian Bullock and Jamie Snow were auditioning and they were like, they, they called my manager after and said, really like this audition. We're going to send it to producers, but we also have this this character named Schwaz that we wrote out of the series because we couldn't find anybody to do it. I'm like, how could you not find anybody? Like, I don't get it. What's with this? So he says, okay, do you want to, my manager says, okay, they want to see you back for this character. Um, and they want me in on a Monday and I was going on a camping trip. Right. And my camping trips are sacred. <laughs> so I'm like, well, <laughs> is it, is it at all? Do I, do I change my camping trip or, or is it possible for me to come in on Tuesday? Oh no, you can come in on Tuesday. No problem. You're the only person they're seeing what? So I'm like, okay. So I'm off on my camping trip with, um, this amazing guy, um, who's a Cirque du Soleil. Uh, he runs the, the idiot workshop, um, John Gilkey, right? He's this Cirque du Soleil director, clown, beautiful work. This guy's amazing. And he's making fun of me all weekend while I'm doing these lines, right? <laughs> Trying to like, you know, memorize my lines for this, this audition, get in on Tuesday, do the audition. It's really weird. Like it's written really weird, like an alien. And he's like kind of monotone. He goes, ha, 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 laughs really weird. And, you know, but I, but I needed an accent. So I brought this sort of mm, 
pseudo Eastern European accent. And I, I, my hair was long at the time and I just pulled, like just kind of pulled it out. So it was kind of crazy. Wow. And, and they loved it and they were like, okay, this is Schwaz. And what I'd found out was they had auditioned uh, kids at first for this role, this alien oh. role. Then they auditioned adults when they couldn't find a kid to do it. And then they gave up because they couldn't find someone that apparently was the sensibility of this character. And then when I came in, they were like, oh, that's it. I'd never had that experience before. Um, and it was pretty cool. Like, it was like, wow. What yeah. If- okay. Um, and and it went from there. And then over time, I, I kind of... I, I couldn't see the first season, so I couldn't see how my, they wanted me to kind of Americanize the accent a little bit. They didn't want it too thick. When I watched it back, I didn't like it. I, I was like, no, mm. no, he has to have a thicker accent. It's got it. We got to do the accent. And so I didn't tell anybody. I just thickened it up. If you notice from second season on, he's got a way thicker accent. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I am making the executive choice on this right now. Yes, yes, um... yes. And I had to make the make the accent up because there wasn't. It was a mixture mixture of. Um, you know, some sort of Eastern European, like, you know, a bunch of different Eastern European, Russian, Yugoslavian, kind of. Yeah, it's Hungarian. like Bosnian, Czech. Like yeah, yeah. It's, it's got, has a little bit of everything in it. It's got that. It's got Italian, Israeli, Swedish, and Spanish in it as well. So Wow. <laughs> How do you make that choice <laughs> when you're looking at the, the sides for the day or the script for the day? How do you well, make the choice of what you're going to do? I'm, certain vowels have certain, like, you know, Ray, right, which is the mm. main, you know, Ray's Captain Man. So Ray is always Rai, you know, so A is always I. So anything that has mm. A in it, it's I. So you just automatically over time, it just becomes normal to talk like that. You know, O is always, it's never O, it's O. Mm-hmm. You know, the yeah. R's are always Rai, you know. Um, it, yeah, it just has its own, you know, its own that weird diphthongs. Is- <laughs> That's a beautiful story, but you know, it also makes me want to say like good on the producers and the creators and the writers for saying, we haven't found the right person for this and we don't want to do an injustice to this role that we've created. And then you walk in and Christian and Jamie are like, oh my gosh, yes, this, this is our person. This is who we need. I learned so much about casting from Henry Danger and from watching Christian and Jamie because what I realized was it's an art form. We don't think of yeah. casting as an art form. It actually is. They're creating a palette. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it hit me the first time, and I've told them this story, where I remember there was a scene in Henry Danger where all the villains were gathered in this like villain dungeon thing. <laughs> and all of there was like a dozen of them. And I looked at all of these, and I was like, this is a tableau of such beauty not, you know, the wardrobe wardrobe and makeup comes together and, and also paints on that palette. But the, the, the original canvas are these actors that they have put together and the brilliance of that casting. Um, I just, just from a physical perspective, sensibility, energy, uh, just, you know, what they brought to each character. It, it, it's, it's really like, I went, oh, now I understand what you do. You're not yeah. just thinking about a particular role. You're thinking about how that role fits in with other roles, you know, and how that energy moves with the whole machine. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. So I have a lot of lot of respect for casting directors. A lot. I have worked with Christian and Jamie a few different times, and Jamie played my best friend on Victorious when I was on Victorious. Right. So it was so fun. Um, they are they are masterminds. They are so good at what they do. It is remarkable. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. 
or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. As a podcast network, our focus is bringing you shows you love to listen to. But we also sell merch related to those shows. And partnering with Shopify has made that both possible and simple for us to do. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor adventures, Shopify helps you sell everywhere because they've got you covered from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. What's so fantastic about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, they provide everything you need to get control of your business so you can take it to the next level. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. And back to the show. Before we get into, you know, the audition part of the whole thing, even though I forced you to share this one, um, I want to uh, make sure to give you a platform. It's Pride Month. I want to give you a platform to talk about your trans journey, what it's like to come out in this industry and how it's been for you and the reception. And also talk a little bit about the incredible thing that you're doing with Nickelodeon, the Trans Youth Acting Challenge, which is so cool. Okay, you got another couple hours? Uh <laughs> Not hours, but we got no, no, we got minutes. No, no. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a process. Uh, you know, when I first transitioned twenty three years ago, nobody knew what this was at all, um, and people know so much more now, don't they? <laughs> it's like everything's fine now. Um, uh, uh, there is such profound misunderstanding about what this is. Um, mm. And it, it, it breaks my heart. Um, you know, when I transitioned 23 years ago, nobody knew what it was, but there was a certain level of open-mindedness around it that they, they didn't know what it was. And so mm. the, they observed me in my process and went, Oh, well, that's what it is. Okay. Cause I was their only <laughs> reference point really, you know, um, and I, I was acting before I transitioned and I took a short break and then acted after I transitioned. Um, so I felt much, much more comfortable after I transitioned, yeah. you know, much more comfortable um, because I was being who I was and acting is a lot about being authentic and I could finally be authentic. Um, when I chose to disclose publicly, it was sort of, a, it was at a time uh, when you know, Trump had just got in, or no, Trump had been in for a couple of years, but I made the decision earlier on. And because I just couldn't stand by and watch some of our rights being pulled back and, and, mm. and the misunderstanding that was happening and the kind of verbal violence. Um, and so I, I wanted to be able to express myself. I, I wanted to be able to say, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't just do it. I had to say it. I had to say, hey, this is my, this is what I've been through. And, um, and so the time article came out and, and that, which it, is a beautiful article. Yeah. Katie Steinmetz is such a great writer. Um, she did a great job, I think. And, and she came on set and we hung out and it was, it was really nice. Um, you know, she, so I, I felt like, like it, we wouldn't do that now. Like now it'd be like, well, mm. so, so what? Right. And then there, it's like, it would be in the midst of all this weird backlash. It was such a different time in you know, whatever it's been four years. Um, but it allowed me, it gave me, it gave me the freedom to express and to advocate and, and to do things like the trans youth acting challenge, which we, you know, was, was all about, you know, I wanted to do something to support trans youth and mm -hmm. knowing, knowing how I felt as a kid, you know, from as young as four and wanting to be a performer and be on television and have opportunities that I couldn't get being in Canada. So I wanted to, provide that for these kids and also for them to see that 
the, even though you are having a trans experience and that is the story that you're living, you know, that is this, this true and very profound story. Um, it doesn't mean that it has to stop you from chasing your dreams or from realizing your dreams. And I really mm. wanted kids to understand that and know that, that you can do whatever it is that your heart desires, whatever your calling is, that is perfect for you. And, and so I, I asked Nickelodeon to partner with me and they did. And, uh, we created this, this challenge for, you know, and trans youth would send in tapes and, you know, uh, and we had a webinar and then we had a master class and, and to this day, we have a database of, of kids that are actors and are very good actors that are getting roles and opportunities because they're in this database. And we have casting mm. directors calling on us and asking us to, you know, do you, we're casting this. Can you, you know, do you have any kids? And we're like, yeah, we have, we, we wow. can, we'll connect you with their parents. Um, you know, it's become, it, uh, sadly, it's different right now. And hopefully this is a temporary phase that we're in where, you know, parents um, very rightfully so are protecting, need to protect their kids and not be as uh, public as they were at that time, which was only four mm -hmm. years ago. Um, there's a massive, massive, profound misunderstanding of the trans experience. Um, what is shocking to me is that we decide that, oh, you know, kids can't decide their gender. Yet they're deciding their gender, deciding their gender all the time. We have no qualms about someone who's not trans telling them that they're a boy or girl at two or three, letting them wear their clothes, using pronouns, names, whatever. It's only if they say this doesn't fit that we tell them they can't know. Mm. Kid, kids know their gender. We, you know, you knew your gender at a young age. You know, I knew my gender at a young age, even though it didn't fit with what everybody was telling me. Kids know their gender. It's very separate from sexuality. It is not about sex. Mm -hmm. And people get that mixed up. So um, it's it's sad that these, you know, that's what's happening now is, is this profound misunderstanding around it. Um, kids do not get surgeries. <laughs> they do not get irreversible treatment. Right. They get support. They get therapy. They get, you know, the ability to community. live in community, to live in, in a you know, be referred to by the pronouns that, that fit their gender, those things are all reversible if needed. And they rarely, rarely ever need to be reversed. So. Right. Well, because it's, it's about being you and just, and that's it. And that's, you know, that's a sim, it should be the simplest thing to understand. And yet, like you said, it's so difficult for people. And it's, 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 um, I don't know, growing up in a space where I was, I've been an actor since I was a kid, so I feel like I've always been a very open-minded and um, I've been surrounded by by everybody my whole life. So to me, it doesn't make sense when people don't accept people for just who they are. Yeah, and it's who they are. It's not a choice. Yeah. It's who. It's like being born with brown eyes. And it's not hurting eyes. you. It's not yeah. hurting them. It doesn't do anything to their life at mm. all. I would say the people, people out there who have some judgments or don't understand this, that's fine. Just please go and educate yourself. Please mm. go and learn. Please understand your biases and dig in so that you're not hurting people. You know? Yeah. So. One other question I have on this, and I, um, I know that we're running out of time, but um, we only have an I want to know half, how you... <laughs> hour and a half left? <laughs> I only have an hour and a half left. Okay. Um, uh, I want to know what you feel is happening within our industry, the entertainment industry. Do you feel like there has been good strides made? What do you think we can do as a community to better uplift trans actors? Um, cast actors of trans experience in non-trans roles. Yeah. And put writers of trans experience in the writing rooms and nurture them to become showrunners. Mm. Um, include more directors of trans experience. Let's get some executives in TV of trans experience. Um, let's just get more people out there who have this experience because, you know, it's, we're, we're, it's not quite, um, it's not quite infiltrated into the diversity conversation yet, um, in the mm. way in the way that other marginalized groups have. Um, it's getting there, but sometimes it's a little bit tokenism, 
as opposed to something mm-hmm. substantial. And we really need to have something more, more substantial, more, you know, there's a, there's a program, a writer's program that I was starting to work on to uh, nurture writers of trans experience. Um, and that's on, that's on hold for a little bit until we kind of get through this. We got to get through a strike. We got yeah, to get, gotta gotta get through some other things. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's really important that we start having, you know, uh, I guess more just seeing, I mean, we are seeing more characters like that. Like I just finished binge watching, uh, somebody somewhere, you know, mm. and there's this, this wonderful, you know, trans slash, I maybe non-binary, I'm not sure how they identify, but they're, you know, there's, there's a character in there and I just love the way they dealt with that character. Love it. It's mm. so brilliant. Things like that change people's lives. And it's just innocuous. It's just like, yeah, that person's just there and this is what they bring to it. And, it, it, and their, their story is relevant and interesting. And so I think we're on the right track. We just have to get a little bit more committed to it and specific. I love that you said that those characters change people's lives because it's true. I mean, it's, it's like watching Halle Bailey become Little Mermaid now. You know, it's, it's changing kids' lives. All of these incredible strides are changing kids' lives. And I'm sure that, you know, you have been an inspiration to so many. I'm sure that so many kids are so thankful for you and your voice and your talent. Oh. And so it's, it's wonderful to hear that. There's nothing more important than that. You know, you're going to get choked up, getting all verklempt. But no, I mean, what else is there other than what you leave behind, you know, in, mm. in your experience doing it while you're, while you're there? Um, you know, what's, what's been wonderful about working on the shows has been it's so easy to make a kid happy. I mean, you just yeah. take a picture with them and they've, you've made their day. I'm like, really? Is that, I wish it was that easy with adults. <laughs> just like, <laughs> take a picture and you're happy. <laughs> like, um, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not hard to, to, to help. And, and so, you know, you want to do that as much as, as much as we can. Yeah. You know? Well, on this show, we like to share embarrassing and funny and awkward audition stories. Now, I know you shared the Henry Danger one, but that one was so good. <laughs> um, do you have any other stories that you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, there's, you know, there's a couple that come to mind, which was when I was in Toronto and I had recently transitioned. So I had been auditioning, you know, perceived as a female mm-hmm. and then auditioned after I've emerged as my, you know, as, as my True authentic self. self, which is a man. And I remember showing up at this one audition and there was a woman who is sort of notoriously a little, what's a nice way to say this? Um, gregarious, maybe. Um, just, she had a big mouth. Anyway, she was just <laughs> like, this woman was just like known for just like, you know, just saying everything. And I'm sitting there and I see her, I'm like, oh no, right? And she looks at me, she goes, you have a sister? (laughs) Uh, And and stupidly I said, no. And she's like, no, 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 no. You look like someone that I used to see a lot at auditions. You have a sister, you must have a sister. Oh no, no, I don't have a sister. Come on, you have a sister. You know what? Yeah, I do. I have. I have a sister. I have a sister. <laughs> like, I don't want to. <laughs> You're like, I just need you to stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that happened once with a commercial audition where it was a, a director. A sort of similar thing happened where they're like, "You look a lot like you know." And they say my old name. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, um, yeah." I know we do. Are you related? And by that time, I've learned. Yeah, yeah, we're related. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I didn't. I mean, it was so. It wasn't that I was hiding something. It was just, it wasn't the right time. I mean, there was, it was a callback. There was like all these agency people there and it was just like, and it's 2001. Like I'm not, you know, what am I going to do? And so I'm like, yeah, yeah. They go, wow. Like, you know, how, how is, how is she doing? Like, oh, she's great. She's, she's so talented. So talented. She's wonderful things. Wonderful things. (laughs) leading she's a lead in a movie now yeah yeah really what movie i'm like uh oh you know what i better go i got to go i got uh oh got to leave <laughs> oh gosh yeah there's there a few awkward situations like that but you know 
Um, We've made it on the other side. We now. are. We're yes. It doesn't happen anymore. Thank <laughs> God. Oh wow. Well, I have had um, such a fantastic time talking to you, and I feel like I could probably um, talk to you for another few hours. Um, uh, stay tuned for part two, three, and four coming and up. Four. Yes, yeah. this is actually going to turn into a mini series. Is, um, why don't we just make the whole podcast? Just it's the Michael yeah. Dupont podcast. That's all you need. Yeah. Bada bing. It's, it's changed <laughs> now. Um, but I want to, <laughs> I want to um, give you the opportunity to talk about anything else that you're working on. I know that you've also directed and, and you've gone into that foray of things. So um, do you have anything else yeah. that you are currently seeking to work on? Well, I'm officially in my multi, multi hyphenate, hyphenate uh, phase of my career now. Um uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I've been directing and I love it and I'm going to continue doing that. I'm really excited about it. I've got a couple of, uh, TV, uh, pilots and series pitches that I'm, you know, putting out that, um, nice. I think, I think are really good. I think people are going to love, uh, so I'm really excited about moving those forward. Um, the solo show that I was going to do that was called four cubits make a man that is now called man interrupted. Uh, mm. it was supposed to go up at the Skylight Theater in LA in May of 2020. And then, oh, gosh. Um, yeah, then there was like this virus. So weird. I know. I was like, okay, we can't do it. I'm like, really? It's just a cold. Uh, why? <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so that got put on hold. And so that's going to be in the works hopefully in the next year. Yay. Um, yeah. And so, and then there's a couple other things I can't really talk about, but, um, I'm really excited about what's coming up and uh, I will have it on my website and on my socials and stuff like that. So please. Follow Which speaking me. of what are your socials so that people can follow you? Instagram is Michael D. Cohen. Uh, TikTok is Michael D. Cohen. Facebook is official Michael D. Cohen. And I'm kind of phasing out Twitter, but Twitter's Michael D. C. S. E. E. But I'm kind of not posting there anymore. I know. It yeah. used to be so fun. Yeah. I miss the Twitter days. Yeah. They're gone. No, it's, they're gone. I just, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather just do Instagram and TikTok. And, yep. You know. I get it. Totally um, get it. Um, well, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been so fun talking to you. And I feel like you are just such a bright light in aw. this industry and so, so wonderful. Everything that you're doing and who you are, you're just wonderful oh well thank you like i just hit my microphone that was good um thank you and likewise likewise it's been it's been so much fun talking with you thanks again to michael for spending some time with me and coming on the show it was such a joy to talk to him and to learn from him and again if you are interested in his acting classes make sure to check out uh the show notes there's a link down there click it and it will take you to the place where you need to be <laughs> Tune in next week for another fun-filled episode. And as always, thanks for coming in. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwein, erstwhile monk-turned-traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God, and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Bantwine, wherever podcasts are available.